the flames that consume me will be those which save them all. What's going on? It is go time. This is Mortar Mike, and this is yet another Watcher of Rounds video. Today is a special, special video. This is Mortar Mike's entry of the relay video contest. I was originally challenged by War Guide that I have to find out what champion, how can I use some champions that are overlooked and make them either amazing or make them accomplish something nice or show where they're really useful in the game and they're often slept on. What I ended up doing was he mentioned a few of them. I think he mentioned Shamir. I know you mentioned Absent and I think he mentioned like Razak as well. I'm gonna be honest, Razak is pretty daggum good. I think his biggest time is gonna shine in the upcoming event for the Pelagios boss. I can't wait to try him out and there to see that. But what I ended up doing was I made a list of five, five champions that I think are overlooked in the game. And I will be honest, one of them is Shamir. Not to say that he's amazing, but I'm gonna show you where I use him and where I think he's really effective in the game, besides facts and trials. Everybody knows facts and trials. All right, so my five are going to be Shamir, Ezrin, Dasomi, Kaneza, and I wanted to go for a tough one, Azor. Those are my five. Those are my five I'm going after. The first one I'm gonna go after is my main man, Shamir. Now he's not my main man, but I wanna, you know what? I wanna lay this rule out beforehand. This is important to do. It's important to identify where champions are good for you in the game. So you have four sections. You have early game, you have your mid game, you have your late game, and then you have your end game. Late game and end game sometimes are combined, but end game is you pretty much beaten everything do you still use this champion? I'm going to say that Shamir for me is an in-game champion. I'm not saying he's in-game in a lot of content, but I use him particularly in one area. That is a Nightmare Void Rift, particularly against the Lasir boss, and I'll show you why. First up on the list is Shamir. He's a little misunderstood as a champion because we think of mages, we think of heavy damage, being able to kill out large groups at a time. Shamir is not the ideal choice for that, but there is an area that I use him in game, and I'm so glad the war guy sent me the challenge right when I was gonna complete Void Rift because I use Shamir in Nightmare Void Rift instead of Silas, and let me explain. That's a big, that's a big deal, let me explain. And I still use Silas, I actually use him in the battle, but I'm gonna show you this team and it includes having Shamir in the team. Now, why do I say including Silas? In a part of the stage, uh, on the far left end of the stage, there's a lot of summons that come out there and they have to be stopped. And usually I would use Silas there to stop them from coming through, to kill those summoners, the guys in like the, uh, the burgundy robes. I would use him, but the problem was when uh, Lasir would pop into the other area, he would pop it from the far left of the screen, I would struggle with the DPS that I needed to take him down. And as a result, I did a lot of wipes, a lot of L's from that. But I'm gonna actually do a straight run of this, showing how I use Shamir, because Shamir in this case, in my, in my opinion, is a better option for this because he does two things. One, he does damage, it's not a crazy amount, but it does stack over time. And two, he does really good crowd control for what I need him for. So this is my favorite place in the game to use Shamir. That's why I wanted to make sure you guys know that I do use Shamir in the content. But if you see right here, I have a couple Legos, I do have a Lord, he's not, it's not necessary to have the Lord. I'll be honest, it's not. I just like that because he's a good substitute option for the front, for covering the crystal and also, he comes to the Lord skills, so it's a bonus. But Baron could do the same job. Olaf could do the same job. I just like King Hars because King Hars has, I call them dense shields, but I'm gonna do this battle live. This is my first run on this boss for Nightmare of War Rift uh, on this rotation. I start off by sending out King Hars. King Hars is just a good enough option here because he can tank long enough for me to get the job done. And immediately after I send out King Hars, I send out Shamir and Shamir is great for this area. I will tell you this, he's not an incredible damage dealer per se, but he does a wonderful job of locking enemies in their place. So right now you see King Hearts taking a beating, and I just go ahead and pop his ult, give him the shield back, which gives him all of his time, all the time he needs to basically endure, endure any battle damage that's coming his way. Next I'm gonna send out our main man right here, Boreas of the Frost. Uh, I'm gonna hold on to that for a moment because nobody needs it. But then I'm going to go with, I'll go with it now. I should have popped it a little sooner, actually. And I'm going to put Zilla 2 here. Zilla 2 is just to be able to stop these ads here. I'm actually going to put it a little closer. 
She may take a hit or two, but I think she'll be fine. And I'm going to go ahead and put Dolores here. And I'm gonna follow with Silas next. And then last but not least is gonna be Brooke here. All right, now I'm gonna send here. All right, yeah, I wanted to pop those ads out. 16, 17, 18, 19. Immediately put him down. If I put him down any slower, he will actually, uh, actually one shot by uh, Silas. Not good. And now I just damage him down. Now, normally Brogni can survive this damage, which is great. If he can survive this damage, I could do enough work to go ahead and survive it without him being needed, honestly, for the remainder of the battle. But I still put him back out. It's just helpful to be able to block these guys from forming up and making dupes of themselves and all that. And then this just becomes more like a stall out match. Like if you notice, he's just gonna keep on dealing damage over there on the right. She may just gonna keep working that area. And it makes it to where that base is covered. I'm not worried about that guy that comes up from the top here. I have Brogni. I'm I keep saying Brogni. Under Priest Brogni from Raid. This is the wrong game, bro. That is not who you're playing with. <laughs> bro, here's who you're using. So right here, I'm gonna use my little EMP boy Boreas. That's what I call him, because he should still be able to reach, right? Even with the nerf. Yes, he still reaches the summoners. Nice. And now it's just waiting it out. But you see how critical his work is over there? I need a champion that could put slow to slow down the progress so that King Hearts can do a whole bunch of shielding, blocking, basically keeping himself alive. He's right in front of the healer, but you do have some tanky champions that come in there and can do a lot of damage to him. He's a great champion uh, in the right areas. So we have to be honest about that. We can't just say he's amazing, all kinds of content. In my personal opinion, he's lacking in the damage category, but since he has slow in his kit automatically, I think, he, if I'm not mistaken, Drowning Water automatically applies like a 25% slow and it can stack. So him doing that attack over and over again, you notice it's doing really good damage and it's allowing me to finish the content. All right, and he should be able to drop the last one, nice. So as you see, I use Shamir and Nightmare Void Ruff against the Lasir boss. I use him because he does really good cleanup duty on the outskirts there and it allows me to do my work. So start I'll put that out there. Y'all wanted to know where is Shamir valuable? Nightmare freaking Void Ruff. I use them there. Could I have used the Comet? Sure. Could I have used another AOE champ like a Vierin or something? Sure. But I prefer using Shamir because I already have him built. I think I have him at A1, which also adds like immobilization in his kit. Look, he's like my lowest built champ. Look at that. Least built to not not bad, but he's only at four stars, but also having the A1 adds immobilize, which freezes them. Basically, they can't move for a full second. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot, but I promise you, the more of those attacks that he gets on there, and he starts locking them down and they stop for a second, and he has an attack speed of like 1.1, they only move for one tenth of a second. And then campaign is one of the best places I've seen them in. Or chapter nine of the campaign with those uncommon destroyers, the big guys, the big burly guys, one, he does magical damage, which is wonderful against them. But two, that slowdown stops them to where they are barely, when I say barely moving, they're barely moving. It makes a mockery of those boys. It shuts them down very nicely. So that being said, that's why I use Shamir. Every champion has some place you can put them to work and they fit the bill. I love the fact that he replaces Silas when I need to do damage. He replaces him, not to say he's stronger, but he's a better suit for that lane, which allowed me to free up Silas and take out the Lasir boss. So if you ever were wondering, where's a good place I can use Shamir? I use him for Nightmare Void Riff. It works every week, so every other week. No, next up, next up, my main man, Ezrin. Let's go ahead and pull him up here. I still love that transition. I can't get enough of that. Ezrin, which is actually one of my highest level champions in the game. So he's number 13. So, why do I say Ezrin is amazing in this game? Some people are like, yeah, I pulled an Ezrin, I don't like it. I'll be honest, I love when I pull Ezrin, especially because right now I have him at Awakened 4. One um, summon short of him, of getting him Awakened 5, and then after that I get stuff for the Awakening Shop. I like this guy for two reasons. One, he can heal across the freaking map. The flames that consume me, will be those which save them all. The flame, the flame, the flame, the flame. If you need to know anything in particular, that's the main thing you need to know about Ezra. His ability, um, Verdant Rejuvenation and Enlightened Breath, anything that works outside of his range, he can get um, a heal, but it's a 50% reduction. Now here's the thing, it'll be a 40% reduction when I fully book it out. He's a single target healer and he's a strong single target healer. 
His ability over here is Enlightened Breath. When the ally drops below 30%, immediately grants a 220% chance attack-based healing. I can scale him to 260% to them. This effect can be triggered one time every 35 seconds. It's originally 45. Check out the Awaken 3. Changes the HP threshold required for triggering Enlightened Breath to 50%. So if they're at half health or lower, he's sending a giant heal their way. I'm gonna tell y'all, this is how I have my bad boy built right here. Got him with a decent attack, not groundbreaking. Could be better. Um, honestly, why do I have him on crit rate? I do not know why yet. Oh, you know what? Because I was trying a different artifact with him. I was trying the one that gives a double heal. So I need to take that off. He does not need a high crit rate. Let's see what these things are right here. A type bonus, a type bonus, healing effect. So the crit rate is just substats that are going in. Thank God, I'm glad it's not a core stat. <laughs> And you guys see my gear it is loaded. Number one is that he can heal across the freaking map. Ezrin is amazing because I use him in the other Nightmare Void Rift. I use him in the Torridor boss, where there's only two tiles that you could put platform champions in the entire section. So there's a bottom left and there's a top right. I put Ezrin on the bottom left. So that way he can heal the defenders and melee fighters that I have there on the bottom. And then I'll have Brokir and I'll have Zillatu at the top and Silas. And then I may throw an Olog up there, and for good measure, I want to guarantee I'm getting all the damage that I need, I'll put a Valeria up there. The challenge with it is, it still takes a while to drop the first Torador, to kill him first, so Broke here still needs healing. So I'll give him the Regal Crest so he can continue to get healing, but he can get healed from the bottom left of the map and get almost a full health off of a single heal. Now that being said, it doesn't give a lot of healing during that part. He gets like one, maybe two out, that's all I need. I can proc his ultimate one time, that stalls out a long time. Then he has the ability where he can get healed, and then when he goes down lower, he'll end up using that frost attack where he isolates himself, where he frees himself and says, freeze where you stand. That's why he's so dope. And then once I knock him down, I'll pick the two guys up, let them walk up to the top area. They continue to battle down below. I put Valeria in front of Olog at the top, and then I aim Zillatu upwards and they knock out the boss the next time he shows up. That's the first reason. Well, that's the second reason, I guess. The third reason, it, I gotta put it full screen. I gotta, I gotta go back to full screen for this. Let me see, can I do it? Shortcuts are working. Okay, we're good, we're good, we're good. The third reason why I say he's amazing is one thing in particular that I did not know was great until I got it. And that was his freaking exclusive artifact. Weaver's Hood, let me tell you guys how insane this thing is. First off, I'm gonna be honest, it's not reliable. So don't expect him to just become the god tier hero of the game if you get this. But when it pops off, it is one of the best abilities in the game, in the game for, um, for an exclusive artifact because he can single-handedly heal an entire map. I've seen him try, I've seen him go really far with it. Um, but it's a, it's a thing that, you, that they don't say in here that's good to know. So artifact skills, Weaver's Hood, Mythic Artifact, increases the hero's healing effect by 12. That's not much, that's not what we care about. After Enlightened Breath is triggered, there's a 50% chance to reset its cooldown, which means he can throw that long range heal out again. But here's the thing, when they say reset cooldown, they mean reset attack cooldown. He immediately throws another heal, so, if he has a champion that has low health, he, instead of doing like heal, 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 it becomes heal, 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 heal. And he sends them to one champion, so the next champion, so the third champion, this dude can single-handedly heal teams out of failing, out of breaking. It's freaking awesome, I will be honest, it's not very reliable, but I use him in the Torador Nightmare Void Rift, and he works wonderfully for me. I, he's the only heal I use in there. There's other ones you can have. So you can have an mm -hmm. Elowen, and she can send like the little wood elf up there and do the heals and stuff. That's cool, and you get some Rage Regen with it. But I love the fact that I found the place where I could put Ezrin to use where he's wonderful. And I'm gonna be honest too, Ezrin is a menace of a champion to deal with in Guild v Guild. Mm -hmm. If you've ever gone against an Ezrin team and they've had their defenders in the front and they just allowed them to just get heals, Ezrin's one of the strongest single target healers out there. I mean, if you want to just look at just the attack, just to be honest, let's just look at just the attack himself. 5.4K, almost 5.5K heals. And you see the way I built him. I haven't even built him for high attack. Now somebody I did build for high attack. And I know he's just, look, look at the defense. Look at the defense. That's not good. But it's amazing when I use him, but that's not about him. We're about Ezrin here. I wanted to tell you guys why I thought that was impressive. Also, as you see, I have him at Awakened 4. 
So at Awaken, I'm just gonna go to one, well, I guess I go to them all. When healing a target, increases the healing amount by 20% of their attack. So if it's somebody that does damage, they get more heals out of it. Nice. nice. If they're a defender, mm, doesn't do as much. Uh, but it doesn't mean it's a negative thing. It's still a positive because sometimes defenders, all, most defenders still have some kind of attack stat. So they get just a little tiny little bit out of that. Not groundbreaking, but nice to have. Awaken 2, healing effect plus 8. Good, he's a healer. Good to have. Number 3, changes the HP threshold required for triggering the light and breath to 50%. That's the one we read earlier. Number 4, rage region auto 1, which is nice. Auto means he doesn't have to be hit or do any heals for this regeneration to go up, which is lovely. And Awaken 5, when Verdant Rejuvenation grants the targets the hero's talent effect. Oh, by the way, um, Ezrin cannot be one shot. <laughs> There's no attack in the game that can single shot him and kill him because his talent prevents him from taking a certain amount of damage per hit. So I think it's down to like 60% or so, if I'm not mistaken. He can only take 60% in one hit. So he has to be hit by two shots, which is great for a healer because it gives him a small enough window to try to get a heal out. But yeah, damage taken at one time would not exceed 60% of max HP. So if he gets hit once and the second one's coming quick, if he throws a heal in, he literally can just out heal it which is dope. And Awaken 5, as we were saying before, when Reverted Rejuvenation grants the targets to heal talent effect, because he grants it when he does his ultimate, by the way, the duration will be increased by three whole seconds, which is big, I'm gonna be honest, a Gilvy Gill that shines the most. Now, where is he using that? I'll, yeah, I'm, I'm getting into the kit today, because this is one of my favorite champions in the game. Grants a 240% base healing to one ally, and also grants him the hero's talent effect, lasting for four seconds. We could turn that to seven seconds of them not being able to be one shot. If they were in a terrible situation, AKA somebody like Kaneza, who we're talking about soon, this makes it very difficult to kill Kaneza quickly. And then I could also get that to what, 300% at a cost of 500. So he does it pretty rapidly. Lovely, lovely. So that's my boy Ezra. Third on the list, we're gonna go over one that I talked about a lot in my earlier videos. Well, that being said, there aren't a lot of places to use this guy, but I will still say that he is an in-game because it's in-game content that he's being used in. In this case, it's going to be a Mortal Codex. No, it's not him. I was scrolling. It's going to be Disomi. So, I'm going to be honest. I will rate Disomi as S tier, but not yet. Not S overall, but there are areas where he's S tier, primarily the Healer Codex. Let me hear, let me tell y'all, he does not do a lot of healing in the healer codex initially. He actually can get a little bit of heals. Now he's not beating anybody else out there, but he heals when it's needed to heal. His basic attack has a 30% chance to grab pro to magic incense. So after the sixth one, he also does it as well. He applies inspiration on your allies, not needed in the healer codex, but magic incense and potent magic incense is a buff. This is something that people forgot. People were thinking like there were only like three or four debuff removal champions in the game. Dasomi is a debuff removal champion and probably, I'm gonna be honest, the best one in the game. The debuff limits everybody's ability to heal. And he's one of the few champions, and I'm gonna be honest, he is the best champion in the game at removing debuffs because he does it so fast and so often. What does Magic Incense do, Mortar Mike? Funny you ask, I figured I'd tell you. If the bearer's HP is higher than 50%, so if it's higher than 50%, it just dispels one debuff every two seconds. Now, if it's potent magic incense, if I'm not mistaken, that's every one second. It lasts for six seconds, yes, and it does one every one second, which is nice. So that means they don't last, they don't keep the debuff for a second. It's gone, but back to normal healings, which helps you get a really nice score in the um, healer codex, in the Wasteland Titan. And then if it goes below 50%, Otherwise, restores their health based on their max HP and the casters attack every two seconds. So every two seconds, he's giving that heal out. Here's what's crazy about that. Look at how long that is. That's six seconds. That is a triple heal to anything to get it up to 50% health. And that also includes the, um, the Aona champions that you're using to heal. If they're in peril, his ability can heal them up to three times per cast. Now, is that insane? Is that amazing? Not necessarily, but combo that with this ultimate here. Vitality Incense, 800, not bad cost. I probably can get it down to 
600 and the initial range is 400. So he comes in just about ready to use it. And I can make it 18 seconds long and I can increase that defense by 30%. I forgot about the defense increase too. He's a debuff, he's a buff powerhouse. This healer can heal two more allied units, which means he can do three at once. It becomes a triple attack, a triple heal. So you can see it up in the screen here. He's tossing three out at once. So it was neat at one. At three, he's guaranteeing everybody has magic incense that's within his range and increases um, their defense by 20%. This effect lasts for 12 seconds. Here's something else to remember too. Starting from the six incense granted, which is in the talent, magic incense or potent magic incense will apply inspiration to allies like I said before. It is gonna be lovely in case you just wanted another source of getting inspiration out there. You didn't wanna to have to equip with Dolores and you just wanted a way to get rid of some debuffs you get on that wave and some progressive um, some progressive content where you can get poisons like the Aracha enemies will put poison on you and then drop rocks on you. It's a nice option there as well. As long as your champions are still alive, I would still recommend a quality healer. But if you don't have a way to get a debuff and you happen to pull this champion, there is what I would recommend using this champion. They are S plus tier. They are lovely in the healer codex. Also grants a shield. I completely forgot he gives a shield. Grants one shield to one ally in range with HP below 35% for 10 seconds. That is golden for a chaotic champion. So they can get low health and then guarantee they're not dying because they're getting the shield. The only downtime about this is a 30 second cooldown. So it's not very lengthy, so you will probably be playing something multiple times before you get the use of using something like that. And there may be better options out there, so I'll be honest. For 10 seconds, the shield value equals 80% of the target's max HP. So if they're a tank, they just got a tanky shield. If they're an attack champion, they got a really good stack of almost double the health they just had beforehand. And you can combo that with other abilities, like they get increased damage as they have shields, or you know, like somebody like a, um, a King Hars. He already has his own shields, but he gets extra durable shields. So stuff like that could be a benefit as well. It's just a little crossplay, not insane. Of course, after entering the field, increases attack by 10% for every 23 seconds, stacking up to three times. Now that could be every 20 seconds. So within a minute, he's got a 30% attack increase, which means his heals are gonna basically, I can't call it one shot, because it doesn't make sense here one heal up to half health, which guarantees that your champions are gonna stay within that 50 health thing. They have to be one shot out of 50% to die. If not, he's keeping them in the fight. It's very nice. Not as amazing as Carnelian because she has a little bit better control, but I love the fact that he has this combo with the ult that's fairly easy to pull off with 600 costs, and you start with 400 when you jump in, and it lasts for 12 seconds. A six second ability. Now, one thing I do not like I think they ended up adjusting this and taking it out of his kit. Um, his ability used to be able to, to crit and last for 12 seconds per magic instance cost. I love that, but I think they made it just six seconds. Unless I'm mistaken, I think it's just six seconds from now on. Increase the chance of granting potent magic to 50%, which is awesome, so that's a one second per um, heal that goes on and debuff removal. Attack 300, 300, I'll say 300%. After permit increase is fully stacked, all basic attacks will grant potent magic incense instead. So all of them are potent magic. Very nice. That's weird. It goes to 50%, and then later it just becomes 100%. Healing effect plus 12, yeah. And then of course you have your A5s here. So after you grant the shield, the vitality incense, the cooldown of guardian fume immediately ends. The cooldown of Guardian Fume immediately ends. Let's go to Guardian Fume, shall we? At the top of the screen. When casting Vitality Incense, which you guys wanna know, Vitality Incense, I believe is his ultimate, Guardian Fume immediately ends. So he gets that shield out immediately. During the effect of Vitality Incense, reduces the cooldown of Guardian Fume to 10 seconds. So here's what happens. He's doing Guardian Fume, oh, he, he, he does Guardian Fume and he gives somebody a shield. Once he gives them a shield, you pop his ultimate. The cooldown ends again, he gives another shield to either that champion or another champion that needs it. And then every 10 seconds, which is gonna be twice during the ultimate, he can toss another one. 80% of their health. Y'all let me know if that's not useful to y'all when y'all are playing. The Somi is a powerhouse. Defense increase, inspiration, debuff removal, heals up to 50%, 
and just consistently keeping your champions topped in that area, which is golden for chaotic champions. When they get down to 30 or so, that's when they're usually best, but you don't want them at 30 for long if they can't stay alive with somebody like a Carnelian. So I will say that that's worth it. Next up, I gotta check my list here. This is one, so this is getting into the tougher territory. Y'all be hating on this champion. I like using her. I like using Kaneza. Now I'm gonna be honest, this is a different type of melee champion. So she can do pretty good damage and she's very, she has really good survivability. I will say I do like that about her but she is a better assist fighter. What do I mean by that? The same thing that I'm gonna mean when I mention Azor. There's some champions that don't hold the front line well, but they're very good assisters to the other champions that are doing great things. Now, will I say she's in game in a lot of content? Not necessarily. Amazing kit, but the damage usually doesn't come out as amazing as it could be. When I get Salazar, I'll retest that because she gets like 100% per key stack in her ult, so that's nutso, which is lovely, but one of the big things you have to remember with Kaneza is her A1 is what brings her kit to life. Now it goes more as we go, but each stack of key restores 3% health per second, which means she's getting a 9% heal per second. Where would that be good more? Where is that useful? I don't know. Nightmare Faction Trials. My favorite place to use her. She's replaced my Valeria. Now why do I say that? I don't mean she's replaced her being used. Valeria's still used. But on the bottom right hand side, Valeria used to have to hold that area and I would have a tough balance between Valeria dying or Valeria killing those champions that would come through with the golden shields that did damage as you did damage to them. But Kaneza can withstand a lot of the attacks, she can avoid a lot of the attacks, and then I would have somebody like a Gluttony that's assisting her. And if the Gluttony killed somebody, if I timed it right, Kaneza would keep her key stacks and just heal back to full health. The next section would come and she would be able to one shot something that comes in or at least knock out half the health. And then she's healing every time she gets a dodge in anyway, which is 3% minimum, 9% maximum, up until the next strong attack she has that kills something. So it's really useful in putting her in that bottom lane because then I was able to put Valeria into the top lane, one below the area aiming upwards, so she could do her ultimate and knock those other enemies down quicker. Helped me a lot in Nightmare Faction Trials. So that's why I say that Kaneza is an amazing option as an assist fighter. She's not one of the champions you want to keep in the front lines for long, but she replaced my Valeria. She gave Valeria space to use somewhere else. The same thing that I said earlier when I was talking about uh, Sh Shamir. It's a champion that does the job that you need done so you can free up the other champions to do great things. That's why I think it's a really good thing. I would love to be able to put her in other content, I think for right now, she needs to be able to do more damage, but I do love her survivability and being able to stay alive in the content. I hear my kiddo's having a tough time. He'll make it, he'll be fine. Let's look at the kit. This is where I have my Kaneza right now. I probably wanna make her just a tiny bit faster because right now she's at 456. I probably wanna get her to like 500 or so because then she gets, I think like a 20 to 25% dodge chance on top of the 12 she already gets, which is getting up towards 40%. It's nuts so. Let's talk about the abilities here. This is cool because after ultimate cast, you already know what happens with Soulbound Arcana, but it's still bugs. So anytime anybody's using ultimates, she gets a 10% bonus, which gets up to 50%. It's useful for her. I'm surprised I actually got a kit put together on her that uses that, which is dope. I think I have attack speed on her, right? Yes, definitely have attack speed on her because I have this as well on the other side. Here's what matters for her. One is speed. Now let's check out the kit. Deals 50 damage to one enemy two times, now this can get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 9, 10. It can be at 60 damage, 60% damage to one enemy two times. That's just her regular attack. Now while she's being attacked, she has a 15% chance. Wait, I don't have my math wrong. 15% chance of dodge. Every 100 attack speed provides an extra 4% of dodge. That's not excluding things like Euphoric Orb, which gives everybody around a 30% boost uh, for you know 10 to 30 to 45 seconds, if I'm not mistaken, a long time, by the way. Extra dodge chance uh, per 100 attack speed can go up another one, so that would be five. So if I had that 500 um, speed and the 5% chance, that's five more. So that's 25 plus 15, 40% chance of getting dodges in. Here's why that's awesome. Oh yeah, just so you read what dodge does. When attack becomes immune to the damage. Just doesn't get hit, just dodges out of the way. It's kind of cool to watch. Key Shatter enhances the next basic attack upon triggering dodge, which is a 40% chance per getting hit, or per being attacked at all, 
making it deal 220% damage one time. Each stack of key makes basic attack and enhanced attack, enhanced basic attack ignore 12% defense, which means 36% defense ignore. You know champions like Asylas do things like that. Problem is this is, a, this is a ability you want to have the speed involved so that she can pull off more often. Now she's not gonna have the craziness of Asylas. Let's not, let's not do that, that's dreaming. But look also, the defense penetration for each key stack could be three, which brings it to 15, which makes it a 45% defense ignore. And then I could make it a 240% damage per hit and dodge. Let's get into two more parts of this. Number one, let's talk about the ult. Ult only costs 600. It can go down to 500. For a fighter, that's lovely. That's wonderful numbers. Consumes all key, which are the stacks that she gets from dodges, and I believe that she generates them as well. Oh, I didn't see that about rage. Ooh, wait a second. The flowing life skill that can enhance some skills effect and stacks up to three times. Upon reaching the maximum number of stacks, gaining this effect will instead regenerate 50 rage. I did not know that. So she gets her abilities even faster because she's overflowing with, that's dope, that's fire. That's dope, so it can get down to 500, and every time she's still attacking and she doesn't have it, she gets another 50 back in rage and she dodges the ability. And you see the ability, you can't say the ability is a fire. Only thing I dislike is if you look at the cinematic, he doesn't die, <laughs> which is kind of embarrassing. <laughs> but consumes all key stacks, with each stack dealing 125 damage to enemies in range one time, that's plural, enemies in range, not to one enemy. So it's an AOE hit. Afterward, deals an additional 400% damage one time. I'm not entirely sure if the second attack is an AOE attack. I'll be honest, it looks like an AOE attack if you're watching it. But it says the first part does it. So I'm just gonna say it may be a double attack. It's just being honest, it's worth me doing. I'm gonna do some homework on my end to make sure because I don't wanna just throw information out that you should throw it. The final strike can also go up to 500%. The key stack consumption can go up another 20% which means it can be 145% damage per key stack. I'm gonna be honest, I'm gonna tell y'all now, every time she does her ultimate, she already has three key stacks. So that's a 400% damage attack, followed by a, what is that, 145 times three as well. You see where the numbers are headed? That's the first hit and then the second hit. Here's where it gets nuts So and why I want Salazar so much, because she has a bond skill Obtain Salazar the Blood Blade, Blood Blade Chieftain to unlock the following bonus effect. The damage that Surgeon Roar deals by consuming a stack of key, the first hit, increases by 120%. Oh yeah, and then um, the basic attacks and the dodge also trigger key, by the way. So if you're wondering how she got those, she gets them from two ways. Basic attack has a 25% chance of gaining one key stack. So just by doing the attack. Triggering dodge has a 100% chance of gaining a key stack. So you have a champion at 500 speed, if you have them booked, I'll be honest, you have them booked, they have a nearly 40% chance of not being able to be hit, per hit. So I gotta say per hit, cause it's not, she's not. But it's nuts so to see a champion with that much usability in the kit of being able to stay alive. You saw the A1, I have her at A1. I mentioned in the video, I was glad to get her at A1 because this was a big deal to me. And it allowed me to swap Valeria out and go higher in Nightmare, Nightmare uh, fashion trials. At A2, probably an attack boost. Oh, crit damage, 15%. So they know you wanted the damage, nice. At three, Surgeon Roar does 100% increased damage of the final strike and inflicts stun. How long does the stun last? One second? Half second, so not amazing, but unable to take action. The good thing about the stun is it does stop you from doing an attack if they were gonna do an attack. So I guess that's nice too. So it puts a stun on her ult and does 100% damage, 100% more damage. That's fire, that's good, I like that. Rage regen by attack, 2%. That's not bad because she does double hitter attacks. And also she attacks fairly fast because you have her at 500 attack speed. <laughs> and enhance as I awaken fire, for every stack of key consumed, this is the ult we're talking about here, increases attack speed by 100 after casting Surging Roar. Lasts for 10 seconds. After every stack of key consumed, increases attack speed by 100 after casting Surging Roar, increase, lasting for 10 seconds. So all you have at 500 speed, now she's gonna be at 600 speed, 700 speed, 800 speed. You see where it's getting nutty? 
how many attacks she does, and then she gets those key stacks right back, and she's going right back into insta healing while she's dodging attacks, and then getting rage again and getting back into it. It's a really dope, well-made kit. The problem with it is people get the kit early. Of course, you don't have Kineza A5 right now. You're not gonna see a shine yet. But I do say when she does get to that for me, I'm gonna be happy, especially if I already have Salazar, which is gonna add that extra damage per key stack on her ultimate. Lovely. So I wanted to give you guys an understanding of her kit. I'm using Wailing Skull as well, because that Wailing Skull is gonna have a good speed and it's gonna have pretty good damage as well. Uh, the good thing about it is the Wailing Skull is gonna be attacking twice when it does this little spin attacks, so that's good damage is gonna be coming for her as well. But if you're pairing her with other champions and you have champions that do bleed, Scarlet Hunt would be nice. You know, cause Salazar does the bleed, doesn't he? Now you guys can see this Well of Skull is not leveled up heavily. So I don't need it crazy level for what I'm using for Nightmare Fashion Trials. I don't need it for that yet. I'll level it up after I get Valeria's one done first. <laughs> but for now, it's good to have one because it's just extra damage she could do. The last but not least, I saved what I consider my best option for last of talking about champions that people don't necessarily like, but they're still useful. Where the heck is Azor? Oh, right there. <laughs> I think Tuning Crystal is not bad on him, but what was the one I would usually use? Probably Tuning Crystal or... Um, Bastion Ring would be the other option. This is not a bad option if he's getting heals, but his attack increased by five. So I'm just thinking about the Rage Regen because that goes up very quickly, which is really nice. If he's getting heals, and I do use Volca in the same team as him, so those count as heals. So he's getting a 40% increase in his ultimate speed, which is at um, 1000, which can go down to 900. But let's get into the actual reason why I say Azor is useful. I made a full video about Azure first off. I put it up in the corner here, uh, the corner here, and tell you guys in more of a detail than this video. This is a summarized version. Azor is awesome in Immortal Codex, the Conqueror boss. When I first started playing it, this guy helped me get to S. How do he help you get to S? Quite simply put, let me go ahead and put this. Let me go ahead and get comfortable. Let me get comfortable. Let me get comfortable here. He got me to S because he provided three things that my champions could not do so far. He was a Constance, and he was a Captain Rev, and actually another Captain Rev, wrapped into one. Now here's why I'm gonna say why, I'll tell you why. All right, so let's look into his kit first and foremost. Looking at his gear here, I think I swap his gear often. Um, I actually put this gear set on Cyrus when I'm doing the Healer Codex. I put this gear set on Cyrus instead of the other one that he has because I'm not dealing damage, I just need high defense and a decent amount of health. So I put this on Cyrus and him and his minions can tank a whole bunch of stuff in the Mortal Codex on the Sokodis boss. But let's get back to that. So that's one reason. Reason number two, let's look at this kit and I'm gonna unveil to you guys parts that you do not know. And I think it's probably gonna be on the Fast City's website. So shout out if you visited there before and start learning the content. But if it is not, I'll let him know. I'm pretty sure that he knows already. Let's talk about the talent. And I want you to think about this every time he's doing an attack. Damage scales of defense. When the Iron Hammer is in a heated state, which is basically an attack, it's a, it's a state that he gets after just doing basic attacks. Attacks have a 30% chance of inflicting the enemy with stun. The stun lasts for a full second. A 30% chance on every attack he does in the heated state. Which is, I'm gonna be honest, in the Conqueror Codex, it's always in the heated state, except right after his ultimate for maybe like a few seconds, and then it's back in the heated state again, and he's doing stuns again. Now, is the damage supreme for him? No. The goal that I wanted to have was his stuns and his ultimate, and his passive ability that gives a ton of buffs to all the other champions, which is nice. Let's talk about it. Here's the basic attack. It's not high damage, let's be honest. Attacks and deals 110% damage to one enemy. Meh, not awesome. Each attack builds up energy for the hammer. After 10 strikes, the hammer becomes, the hammer enters the heated state. It takes a while to build up, but once you have that, that's when you unlock the second half of his perks that he can give champions. Let me explain. You see down here at Awaken 1, when attacking, there's a 10% chance to cast Fortifying Sparks on the ally within three tiles. That's in the same range, right? Let's talk about Master Craftsman, and then we're gonna get into Fortifying Sparks. Each attack increases his defense by 1% up to 10 stacks. 
Gains an extra 15% defense and deals 15% more damage when in the heated state. Now I said, the damage is not a big issue we're worried about, but I like the fact that his defense and his damage, which means he gets a double stack on his end, which is nice. Um, then you see the heated state defense can increase by another 10%, the damage can increase by another 10%, and the defense increase per attack can double. So it can go up to a 20% increase in defense, followed by a 25% increase in defense and a 25% increase in damage, which is, be honest, it's not groundbreaking, but that's some, that's some good numbers that add up as you continue to do attacks and he's consistently sitting there. I will say too, to those that say that Azor is trash, I'll be honest, he doesn't have an unyielding, he doesn't have a shield asterisk, quote unquote, but he um, has a little, a little bit of survivability that works enough for where I use him. Defense increase per attack per 1%, that's good, so that gives him up to a 20% increase, and then you saw the other numbers I just talked about. Boom, 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 that's nice. Fortifying Sparks and his ult are two things that should not be overlooked. This is one of the coolest abilities in the game because of what it can give you. Fortifying Sparks is just a passive ability that happens while he's doing attacks. When Tempering Strikes is active, every strike will apply a buff to one random ally within three tiles. I'm gonna tell you, if you wanna know how big one, you wanna know how big three tiles is, but Reyes did get a recent nerf. He did get a recent cushioning, but he's at 3.5 tiles. So you still see how tremendous that range is of how many champions around him he can apply this buff to. That's the entire Conqueror area. Everybody on Conqueror area can reach him. Like if he's by the gate, he can reach everybody. Everybody. Replies one buff to one random ally within three tiles, which replies a buff based on the current status of the hammer. The normal state is just him attacking, not having the heated state, which I'm gonna be honest, is not gonna be for long. It's gonna be very seldom. Applies a shield equal to 110%, can scale to 120% of the hero's defense for 10 seconds. This is every time he does an attack, he hands a shield out to somebody. But wait, there's more. When it's in the heated state, applies both the normal state buff and damage increase. How much damage increase do you say? 15% increase can scale to 20% increase in damage that lasts for 10 seconds. So while he's doing his ultimate, he's giving champions around him a 20% increase in damage and also a shield that's equal to 120% of his defense, which you've already had scaled up pretty high. Why is this good, Mortar? Well, before I had Captain Rev, I had Azor. Azor will hold the line in front of my Cerberus or my Atriox Aatrox, I said Aatrox, that's Halo. My Aatrox, because they would die too quickly and I wouldn't have the right time for them to pop their ultimate and get the best bang for my buck. So what he would do is he would pop his ultimate when I think that my Cerberus was taking too many hits, he'd give him a gigantic shield, and then I'm like, okay, it's getting close to the end of it. I'll let him do his ultimate with the 20% damage increase he's gonna have as well, and the shield, so he's gonna lose the shield, he's gonna take too much damage, he's gonna die, and I'm gonna get that real big, nice ultimate going off for Cerberus, which is nice. And for Aatrox, it was good too, because Aatrox could heal. He was a little more efficiently at staying alive, but Cerberus is always gonna be the big bang in the damage when you time it better. I do like the fact you can get Aatrox back more often. But why else did I say that that was awesome? That allowed him to get the high score that I was trying to get. Here's the thing that people do not know about Azor. Azor's ultimate has a huge range. So if we're looking right here, people see this and they don't get impressed. If I go to details here, you see that single dot? Not very impressive, right? Not that awesome. What if I told you, tempering strikes, it has a nine grid. What I mean by nine is it's nine tiles where he's doing damage at once. So in Conqueror Codex, he can hit up to five enemies at once while he's using his ability. Each strike causes 125% damage up to five enemies in front, which means five enemies are being hit, the 30% chance to be stunned for a second. Five, 30% chance to stun per hit, and it's a 15 second long lasting ultimate. So it's good to pop for the right moment. Boom, you got what you need, you keep it pushing. When the skill ends, removes the hammer's heated state. Now I think at Awaken 5, that goes away and he just keeps heated state forever. But you know, that's something you're gonna worry about when you get Awaken 5 Azor, which isn't anytime soon for most players. It covers a wide area. So I put him right there front and center with Cerberus. Now I have Captain Rev does a better job for me there because he does a lot more slows and he does a lot more stuff of keeping the enemies off of Cerberus and it's ult is really useful in that content. So I say that's a better choice. That's why I ended up using Azor. 
I couldn't get shields on my champion because they died too quickly, so he ended up putting shields on them to keep them alive. You can't put the lords down, and if you don't have a constant, you're not getting that inspiration going on in the content, so why not get a 20% attack increase on all the champions that you have out there at once? A defender that can do an attack increase is nice, and also, he doesn't die that, that often because he's very, very, very tanky. And if you have somebody like a Volca out there, which I actually use for Mortal Codex, because she has a lot of AOE hits that she does. She basically does them like back to back or like one hit and then back to back again. So it's a lot of AOE damage, but on top of that, she's letting everybody else who do damage get heals. So you see why I'm seeing the benefit and where Azo is useful in this? Now, I will say this, I'm gonna put this out here because I know somebody's like, oh, he's terrible, he's trash, no, 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 no. He's also a great assist champion in Guild v Guild. Now, I'm saying assist because you don't want him in the front. You want him alongside in the fortress. In the fortress, because they all have to come down into one lane. If you can have them alongside, what's good is, let's say you have a bookkeeper that's coming into attack, your defender's right here, Azor's to the side of him, or better, I'm sorry, to the other side of him, and, uh, and like one down. So the bookkeeper has to come up and do his attack. That attack will not hit Azor. I'm sorry, one straight over to the side, one straight over, and went down, that attack will not hit Azor because it hits in a T pattern instead of just directly hitting them on board, on, head on. So while he's there, he's doing his ability at A1, he's casting extra shields, he's casting extra heals, or not heals, he's casting extra shields and extra damage to nearby champions. So it's just that little bit of buff and benefit that goes with the team. And then if you try to mob out against the other team, his ultimate knocks five of your enemies at once with a chance to stun them every time they get hit in a giant range. So. Not an amazing S tier champion, but there are areas where you can use champions like these where people say that they aren't great. Don't feel bad when you get champions like these. You will want other ones, sure, but it's good in this kind of a game. You want to first and foremost know where champions are useful. That's the most important thing. Don't just say, oh, they're not S tier, they're not great, they're not amazing. Now, Absan, I'm sorry, bro. I can't help you. There's some areas he's good at. It was funny as the main area we thought he'd be good at. He can't be used that. The new Pelagio's boss. I'm not defending the man because I don't have him. So, <laughs> that being said, that's that on that. But um, yeah, I hope you guys have been enjoying this relay video series from everybody who's been making content. We have Cold Brew, we have Ronaldo, we have War Guys, and of course yourself. Of course Hi. myself. Um, and of course, wow, I just killed that whole thing. We have our boy Cold Brew who started it off. We have Ronaldo, we have War Guys, and then yours truly, Mortal Mike. I hope you guys enjoyed this content. Tell me what you guys think about this. What are some other champions that you see in game and you wanna know where are they useful at? I'm not doing Harpoon. I've never built him, so I don't see the value in him. Do I say he's bad? Mm. Compared to others, there's better options. If that makes him bad, then we will say bad but there are areas where many champions in the game get a chance to shine. Let's not forget, Aveline and Tazira got to shine thanks to Immortal Codex. Two champions you didn't even consider using because Tazira doesn't do high damage and Aveline has other options that have unyielding and there's very few instances where you're gonna need a champion that does a bunch of stuns sometimes, but Ahsoka this boss, she's probably one of the top five best champions to have in there. I guess Ahsoka this Codex boss. So. This has been your boy Mortal Mike. Let me know what champions you guys think that I was hyping up a little bit too much. I'll be honest, I got on the, I got on the bandwagon a little bit because I like to see areas where champions can be useful. Shamir surprised me the most because I was in a really tough situation trying to figure out how to beat that Lasira boss in Nightmare Void Riff. And Shamir taking Silas's spot made it so much easier for me to beat Nightmare Void Riff every two weeks with that one. And then, of course, Ezra and the same with the Torador boss for Nightmare of Warrior. But you guys have heard me ramble long enough. Let me know in the comments what champions you guys want to know where they're useful at. I may actually continue this up. I might call it something like D tier. I think not, you know, and talk about more champions that are good. Let me know who you want to talk about. I'll brag about them in some of the future videos. This has been your boy, Mortal Might. I hope you guys like the little transitions and stuff that's going on here. I'm working. Oh, that transition wasn't that cool. That's the first one that's done, and then go back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm working at OBS now. It's a little clunky, so hopefully my audio is clean for this because I'm fully trusting that this thing is doing its job right now, and I don't know if it is. <laughs> but this has been your boy, Mortal Mike. I appreciate y'all. 
I love y'all's feedback. Let me know what you guys are enjoying. Shoot some likes and subscribes. I don't say that often. I usually leave another notification that goes up and there's a little click and then the clicking goes off. But I'll just say it. Thank you guys. I appreciate y'all. Y'all are helping to get me a couple extra snacks in the house while I make haunted about a game that I enjoy. Y'all take care. See y'all soon. Peace.